Good afternoon, and from Consol Energy Park, we bring you Vulcan Baseball here on CUTV. The clouds are starting to part, and what looked to be an overcast day is turning into a nice day for some baseball for the California Vulcans as they take on the number one team in the PSAC West, the Mercyhurst Lakers, in another doubleheader. Hello, everybody. I'm Zach Prosper. Joining me today is Danny Beck, and our first and only coverage of baseball here this year in Game 1. The California Vulcans and the Mercer's Lakers, I mentioned the Lakers are number one in the standings. California right now, they are tied for third, but it's kind of a mess up in the standings right now from one to four. All those teams, they take the top four in the PSAC West for the playoffs. It seems those four are set, it's just a matter of seeding at this point in time, Danny. Yeah, and the Vulcans here today, if they can get a victory, uh, will bounce them up. Uh, yesterday, the Vulcans played uh, the Lakers in Mercyhurst. Uh, which they split one to one in a 21 to six game. You know that's high scoring. We're going to see more of that here today, um, especially with this turf. Yeah, and as Danny mentioned, it's an all turf field at Salt Energy Park. And you mentioned those games yesterday at uh, Mercyhurst, California. They lost the first game one to eleven. But talking to Coach Connie before the contest, he said it was just one inning. And we were hitting the ball hard, but it was going right at the defenders, kind of atom balls. And in the second game, they were able to get a victory 6-3 over one of the best teams historically in the PSAC. Yeah, and these new balls uh, allowing the pitchers to not really get a good grip on the ball, so that makes it more for an offensive production game. And hopefully we can see here if the Wolkins are on the, on the right side of that victory. Yeah, we will definitely talk about the changes made to the baseballs this year, the flat-seamed balls, as they like to call them, as well as some of the BB core bat elements that maybe impact the game. When we come back, we'll have first pitch here for Katsal Energy Park, and that will be the beginning of baseball coverage here on CUTV for the 2016 season. First pitch will be coming up next on CUTV. With Cal U's six on-campus residence halls and Vulcan Village's garden-style apartment complex, University Housing offers the very best value service, convenience, privacy, and security. On-campus students will have easy access to classrooms, the newly renovated Natali Student Center, and a variety of activities across campus. University housing properties includes all utilities. Other common amenities to all properties are fully furnished rooms, high-def cable TV, high-speed Wi-Fi access, and live-in professional staff. Balkan Village also includes a full kitchen and laundry room. The property has a 24-7 fitness center, convenient shuttle service, and an outdoor seasonal saltwater pool. Model rooms and tours are available. Stop in the University Housing Office or contact us by phone or email to learn more. For almost 30 years, CUTV has been the campus and community home for local news, sports, and entertainment. Broadcast in 100,000 homes in southwestern Pennsylvania, CUTV provides complete coverage of Vulcan sports as well as high school football coverage. Broadcast weekly live, CUTV News Center provides coverage of local and campus events, weekend weather, sports highlights, and feature stories. For more information on CUTV, check us out on the web, friend us on Facebook, or follow us on Twitter. Hello and welcome back. First pitch is just a few moments away. Again, I'm Zach Prosba and joining me is Danny Beck for CTV's first coverage of Vulcan Baseball for the 2016 season. Uh, we talked a little bit about the standings in the open and right now we're going to go over the lineups and for California. We'll go over their defense first. In center field leading off you have Mick Fennell, one of the best Vulcans of all time. We'll talk about that a little bit as we go on. Second base, batting second, Garrett Brooks. Now at first base, batting third, Chris, Chris Waschak, excuse me. Catching and batting fourth, Christian Webb. The designated hitter and starter of the second game today for California, Joe Yorgel. Batting sixth and playing shortstop, Austin Logan. In left, number 32, Jared Grove. In right, number 17, Bobby Thompson. And the number nine hitter, number 23, Levi Kraus. He'll be Manning the hot corner at third base. And doing the pitching for California today is G.J. Senchak, who holds the all-time record for California in most innings pitched. And he is a senior, and today being senior day, this will be his last official 
PSAC contest here at home that is recognized at least on a weekend. He does have a home doubleheader next Friday against UPJ, but being the third game starter, he'll likely play next weekend, not here at home. So this is his last chance to play here at Consolidated Energy Park. Now we'll move over to the Mercyhurst lineup and leading off playing second, it's Brendan Cox. Batting second and playing third, Austin Elong. Batting third and center field, Chris Gonzalez. Clean up, first base, Hank Morrison. The designated hitter, batting fifth, Daniel Elliott. Shortstop, batting sixth, Cameron Bayego. Batting seventh, Sabatino, Donardo the third, who will be the catcher. We'll look at the other few after we get this first pitch here from Senchak to Cox. And it's down and away, ball one. And Danny, we talked a little bit about how the new seams impact some pitches for uh, the pitchers in the PSAC. As we see one move in for a strike, a late call there, even to count one and one. Yeah, it's different to see. It's more of an offensive uh, game, even from that respect, that they can't get those breaking balls in and, and really strategic pitching. And here's a ground ball to shortstop. Logan not able to control it. And before the game, we met with Coach Connie, and he said he values defense above everything else. And he said there's no reason that you shouldn't get a ground ball on this turf. He calls it carpet. And right there, just ate him up, let it handcuff him, and it bounced out of his glove. Yeah, it looked like he kind of over-anticipated where that ball was going to go. Uh, kind of was out of position even. Looked like he was too on top of the ball. And uh, that really didn't allow him to turn and, and get that, that ball fired over to first base. Unfortunately there, um, we can see if the, if the Vulcans can can get back in this game. It's, it's early on, so we'll see how they how they heat up. E6 to start the ball game. Senchak now in a stretch. His first pitch, it's going to be a bunt. Goes right to Senchak, past him, and the throw to first is late, so it'll be a bunt single. First and second, no outs now. Brooks not able to come up and get that quick enough. Yeah, it looked like the pitcher, uh, Senchak, or, yeah, Senchak was going to go get the ball, and and they just, they're over-anticipating everything, it looks like, early on. So they just got to just do what they know, uh, do what they learn and practice and all that stuff and kind of use it in the game. And Coach Connie will come out here now and meet with his infielders. Actually, that is the pitching coach, excuse me, not Coach Conti, that is Anthony Rubianski, the assistant coach. And out there just probably saying, you know, guys, relax. We know this is a good team. We don't want to get them out to a quick start. Uh, really, this is not Mercyhurst doing well. This is kind of mental errors on California's side. If they correct those, maybe they'll get out of this inning. Yeah, and the first uh, single there, uh, just the shortstop really was not, he, he, he kind of turned, he was thinking more about the throw over there than just fielding the ball first. Um, you really have to focus on everything, use your your, uh, your techniques that you learn in practice and just bring them over into the game. And, you know, they'll, they'll get past those errors early on and, and, and hopefully they'll move forward. We're going to see Chris Gonzalez up to bat here for the Lakers now. The center fielder, runners on first and second, no outs. First pitch in there for a strike on the outside corner, 0-1. Senchak looking to get a double play ball out of here. At least, worst case, maybe get that lead runner at third. He's into the stretch. Winds and throws. And now a high fly ball. This one's going into the stands, though, out to the right side. And bounces down for a loud foul ball. It'll be 0-2. Yeah, and even here you can see uh, Senchak kind of trying to go low, um, get a, a, a grounder out of that, like you said, trying to get into a double play. Um, but we can see what he does here as uh, Gonzalez is out to bat. And maybe here, maybe best case, maybe get a strikeout and then bring up another guy for a double play ball, get you out of the inning. Pitch here, and this is rocketed out to center field. Going back is Finnell. He's at the wall, and it's off the batter's eye. Finnell gets the throw in quickly. They're going to send the runner. Here's the relay, and Logan is just going to hold it. Doesn't even throw. I think if he had thrown it, he might have had a chance, but he's going to hold on to it. And now the Lakers are out to an early one nothing lead. Yeah, and I think that uh, he was he was looking at going home, but then he was also looking at the runner at second, um, seeing if he would have anticipated a run even. Uh, he could have thrown it over to uh, the second baseman, Garrett Brooks, and, and try to get that out. Uh, just let one early. Hopefully they can get back. Hank Morrison up to bat now for Mercyhurst. He comes in with a current 16-game hitting streak. He's been on a really hot tear in the last couple of months or so. First and second still as that was just a long single off the batter's eye. Morrison watches the first one in for a strike. 
Sunchak trying to limit the damage here. Just one run in the first inning. You mentioned he gave up 10 runs in the third inning yesterday in the 11 to one loss, Danny. And Morrison swings and misses in the inside pitch, 0-2 now. And as you said, that, that third inning, giving up 10 runs, they, in talking to Coach Conti, like you said before, the game started, it was more of they were getting the lucky the lucky falls. Uh, Mercyhurst was, if, if a ball just happened to skip past a second baseman, that allowed a, a runner to score. So it was good pitching from the Vulcans. It was just the Lakers were taking advantage of the opportunity. Here's the 0-2, and ground ball foul down the left field line. So count remains 0-2, still no outs here. Top of the first, Mercer striking early out to a 1-0 lead. And G.J. Senchak, you, you know, he, he's throwing strikes, and uh, and that's that's what you want to see out of a pitcher early on in the game. You don't want to see any any walks or anything like that. So he's doing his job. His defense just needs to hit, come around him and, and help him out. Webb sitting up on the inside part of the plate. Here's the pitch. It's back foul. This one actually going to go out of the stadium. It moves a bird out of its nest, a couple of them actually, so don't know exactly <laughs> where that one landed, but count remains zone two. And being where we're at, Danny, behind the plate, we're not able to see exactly where these pitches are going. It looks like Sunshak, he's maybe in the strike zone too much. Mm -hmm. You never will be throwing strikes consistently enough. You want to throw some outside, maybe get a guy to chase. We'll see if he does that here. Inside part of the plate again, this one goes up high and outside. And like you said, uh, he strung it in the strike zone. And before the, when we started the broadcast, you know, those, those breaking pitches aren't as prevalent in this game now that there's uh, a different ball that they're throwing. And, you know, that kind of limits what the pitcher can really do. Um, it limits them to a fastball and change-ups even rolling off their fingers. Um, so hopefully he can, he can do what he can. 0-2. Oh, inside. Oh, they're going to call an inside strike here. Morrison goes down looking. That one looked to be... Just a little too far inside, but they get the friendly call. And painting the corners there, uh, Senchak has experience. Like you said, he's the all-time leader in innings pitched. Um, he's seen a lot of different batters. He's seen a lot of different umpires, and he knows where he can get his strikes at and uh, just taking advantage there and just getting that great strikeout. Daniel Elliott, the designated hitter, up to bat now. Still runners first and second, now one down. First pitch. Will be outside, called for a strike though. Maybe about the same spot where he struck out Morrison with that one. So Senchak getting those calls outside on the corners, he's really gonna help him. Here's the 0-1, and this one is flown out to left field. Should be an easy play there for Grove, and it is. So now there will be two down, and after a very kind of Inauspicious start to the inning. Mercier, they've stranded a couple runners back to back, and California could get out of this with not a lot of damage done. Yeah, and with learning where hit, uh, where Senchak can throw his pitches early on in the game, that will really help them later in the game um, because they, they understand where the umpire will call a strike and where he doesn't. And uh, so, you know, just, just learning early on, uh, I think can, can help in the long run for the Vulcans here early. Cameron Bayego. Coming up to bat now, the shortstop for Mercier's number 22. This one outside for a ball, not able to catch the corner. 1-0 and the count now. and Maybe only the third or fourth pitch we've seen outside of the strike zone so far in this inning. Everything's either been hit or in the strike zone. Here's the 1-0. And fouled back out of play out of the stadium yet again. And... Now the count will be even one and one. And Danny, if Senchak gets out of this inning, only allowing one run, it has to be a big confidence builder for this California team. You know, mental mistakes early on. Yeah, a couple hits got in, but the one deep fly was limited to a single. Against this Laker team, you have to limit them, and maybe getting out of this with only one run is going to be huge for them. Yeah, and as you said, the mistakes early on, uh, that just shows Senchak and even the Vulcan's character um, sticking in this. They're not letting them get them down or getting anything that happened get them down. So that shows good character. And the pitch is in there for a strike. One and two the count now, and Senchak, after the first three hitters reached, has a chance to set down the next three and get out of the inning. Senchak stepping off the rubber and getting the signs again from Webb. So 
Senchak is set. Here's the pitch. And this one fouled down the right field line out of play again, so the count will remain one and two. But Ago just staying alive on that one. Yeah, and extending his at-bat will not only uh, kind of get his chances higher to maybe get something in there, but also Senchak will get a, bit, a little bit tired, um, especially after those mental mistakes early on. So hopefully Senchak can stick with it and uh, see what he can do here with one and two count. Maybe go a change up, maybe try an off speed, see what you can get out of that when you set the flat seam balls now. Here's the pitch, and it's in there for a low strike, and Senchak gets out of the inning, leaving two on base, and California only down one nothing after it looks like it could have been a lot more. Oh yeah, and that strike out there was just a great pitch. Like you said, low. Um, I'm not really sure we, from our vantage point if that was a, a breaking ball, uh, maybe a changeup, like you said. Uh, but just a great pitch. Got it in there. Two strikeouts in the inning. Um, way to stick with it. And we'll look at the tail of the tape now, Danny. And California, they're about middle of the pack in all of the statistical markers in the conference. Mercyhurst. 339 average, 319 ERA, 346 strikeouts as a staff. That is all number one in the conference. They're also number one in fielding percentage as well. And it's great to see Cal, um, everything's coming together for them. They could have let that get down because of the fact that David Marcus hasn't been playing. I think he's only played seven games this season, and he's really the big contributor when it comes to hits, uh, home runs even. He, I think he was a leader last year from that. So uh, the Vulcans really are stepping up, uh, whether it be younger players or even senior players taking up a bigger role. It's great to see the Vulcans. Everything is coming together. Uh, apart, aside from that 6.02 ERA, um, that also comes in with the, the flat balls and more of an offensive style of, of a game. And, you know, that's going to happen. Uh, pitchers really are trying to do what they can. And game yesterday, like I said before, it was actually 11 to one. I think in the in the broadcast earlier, I said it was a little bit more than that, but it was 11 to one. And uh, with a, a huge inning in the third, you know, what can you do in that situation? You just have to limit those errors, limit the, the balls that you throw out there. So just keeping in this season for the Vulcans, it's great to see. And California, they have a chance if they're able to win one or both of these games, keep moving up the standings. Currently right now, they are two games back of Mercyhurst in the standings. So if they are to win, then they would actually move into first place because they have the tiebreaker. They have won three out of four matchups with the Lakers. And that would be huge if California is able to get a, a one or a two seed out of the division. Uh, that'd be definitely big, maybe even possibilities of the D2 playoffs uh, after all said and done in the conference tournament. Yeah, and that would be huge. Um, talking to Conti again, he said that this would be the 14th season in a row that they make it to the playoffs, so that would be huge with this team. Here's the first pitch from Nasinski. Fennell watches it in there for a strike. Mick Fennell, the center fielder, comes in nine hits shy of the single season record for the Vulcans. He's already second all time in the PSAC in triples. He watches this one outside. And with eight home runs on the season, he's not afraid to get one out of the park here. And also with 57 hits, his on-base percentage as uh, the, the leadoff hitter is just great. And uh, we can see what he can do here. Here's the pitch. And Fennell watches it outside, ball two. Fennell leads the team with a 422 average. He's second with 31 RBIs. He's also leads the team with 49 runs scored. Here's the pitch, and he does go around. And umpire had to ask for clarification on that one, but even from this vantage point, I could tell he went around that pitch. Two and two to count now. Fennell gonna have to stay alive here, fight something off. A wide outside stance from the left hand batter's box. Here's the pitch, and it's fouled away to the left side. Nasinski trying to get Fennell out here. If Fennell gets on, he's always a threat. He also leads the team in uh, stolen bases, about 17 this year off the top of my head. Here's the pitch. And he'll watch it dip, dive in for a ball. Three and two the count. And yeah, Fennell just has to be smart here. If it's in, just turn your hips and just get into that ball and see what he can do here as a leadoff hitter. Nasinski. Gets the sign. Here's the wind and the pitch. And outside, ball four. So Fennell starts the inning off with a full count walk. 
And that's huge. Uh, like I said, see what he can do. And he gets on base. He does what he does best. And uh, the Vulcans just really need to get back in this game, although it is 1-0. Uh, if you can start off the game with some, some production from your offense, uh, try to limit those defensive mistakes. And, and uh, the Vulcans now with their second hitter up. And Coach Connie talked about, you know, with all the run production, you don't see a lot of bunts anymore. Won't in this scenario either as Brooks fouls the first pitch back. But being a one-run game, early innings, I thought maybe a situation could have come up here where you could sack Fennell over and bring Waszczak up, who leads the team in RBIs. Nisinski in the stretch now. And time is called here by Brooks as Nasinski looked like he had his eye on Fennell the whole time, wasn't really committed to throwing that pitch there. I was waiting to see if Fennell might break. Back into the stretch. Now he's set and pick off move over to first base. Nothing there. Fennell back in, easily safe. Yeah, I'm not sure. I was just thinking in my head, I was like, I wonder what it would be like to slide on this turf. Would you slide more? Or would you kind I, of stop? I think he would because you have to start earlier because on the turf you're going to move faster. You don't want to slide right before the base and then move over it. As Brooks watches, this one goes inside, ball one. But Fennell, he might honestly have to start his slide where the umpire is standing at in between first and second base. He may have to start it there and just let his progress glide him to the base. I, I imagine that would be kind of scary even if you overshoot the base and you know that could be an injury. Brooks swings and misses at the off speed pitch. It'll be one and two the count now. Looks like he wasn't anticipating the off speed there. And they'll have to try and fight something off. If you can at least move Fennell over, be a productive out instead of standing at the plate striking out. But we did mention that Mercer leads the league in strikeouts so their pitchers are able to do that and see another pickoff move here. He's keeping his eye on Fennell, and, and the third baseman was shying up the whole time, but now a one and two count, he's kind of pushed back and not really focused on trying to get the bunt down. Here's the pitch, and this one is high. Looked like he was trying to dive into the zone, but it stayed up too much, so two and two the count now, and I can see this being a situation where Fennell maybe takes off, uh, looking for maybe an off-speed pitch, or if Brooks is able to connect on a fastball and drive it into a gap. Here's the 2-2, two and, two. and this one right at the shortstop line drive, and he is out at first base. Fennell not able to get back, so double play as Brooks made good contact. Fennell just off a little bit too much on that play. Yeah, that was a heads-up play by Mercyhurst. Um, you know, they just knowing the situation, and Fennell kind of got stuck in a sticky situation there as well, uh, trying to get back. As you can see here on our replay, um, the shortstop, just a great play from Mercyhurst. Uh, knowing the situation, that was huge. And unfortunately, we weren't able to get the first base call back there. It was bang, bang. Looked like it could have gone either way, but Fennell was called out. Waschak at the plate now watches the first one for a strike. Yeah, and Waschak, one of those hitters that's really stepping up with uh, 42 hits on the season and a 323 average. So they, that's big, too. Next pitch outside, ball one. And Waschak last year as a freshman. One of the big contributors for this team, him and David Marcus were going to make a great pair this year in the 3-4 slots. As the next one is outside, but Marcus went down with injury. You mentioned only played seven games this year. He will be back next season. Maybe we can see the Cal offense even more powerful next year with these two together. Lost check, waits for the 2-1. and one. Here's the pitch, and he swings and misses on an inside and low pitch. And with David Marcus out, um, you can see a lot of those freshmen. Uh, Christian Webb, starting catcher today, uh, he's also stepped up. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how this team develops uh, next year when a lot of these seniors leave. And Washak swings and misses at the pitch outside. So Mercyhurst, even though Fennell leads off the inning, get out of it with a double play line drive and a strikeout. Mercyhurst leads 1-0 after the end of the first. We'll come back second in the action here on CUTV. Cal U's six on-campus residence halls and Vulcan Village's garden-style apartment complex, University Housing offers the very best value in service, convenience, privacy, and security. 
On campus, students will have easy access to classrooms, the newly renovated Natali Student Center, and a variety of activities across campus. University housing properties includes all utilities. Other common amenities to all properties are fully furnished rooms, high-def cable TV, high-speed Wi-Fi access, and live-in professional staff. Balkan Village also includes a full kitchen and laundry room. The property has a 24-7 fitness center, convenient shuttle service, and an outdoor seasonal saltwater pool. Model rooms and tours are available. Stop in the University Housing Office or contact us by phone or email to learn more. And welcome back. Second inning action about to get underway. California down one nothing after one, Danny. And it looked like Fennell leading off that inning with a walk. Maybe something was going to get going, but an unfortunate line drive double play change that entire inning. Yeah, and it could have been a drastically different game if uh, Senchak was not able to to kind of get those strikeouts that he did get, thankfully. Um, so we can see here what the Vulcans can do. Um, their offensive production just getting off to a little bit of a shaky start. And uh, you saw this yesterday when they played uh, Mercier. So they kind of shake off the cobwebs even a little bit yesterday. So hopefully they can get some production and kind of limit Mercyhurst uh, run scoring abilities. Leading off for Mercyhurst will be number 20, the catcher, Donardo the third. California may be looking for a 1-2-3 inning here. Get back on the offensive side quickly. First pitch fouled off back to the uh, backstop. 0-1. Senchak got out of an early jam in the first inning, looking to maybe continue the success he had the last few batters. Pitch grounded down the third base line. Kraus has it, throws on the first, and the out is recorded. Waszczak really had a stretch there. It looked like he was stuck a little bit, but he's able to get back up. Yeah, and right there, the third baseman for California uh, just got a great hop on that. Uh, Kraus, sorry. And, um, you know, great stretch by, uh, by Waszczak over there. And it looked like when he went down for the stretch, I thought he dropped the ball at first the way he was kind of moving his glove, but it looked like it was just kind of one of those one of his foot was playing. It was like, no, oh, crud, I can't get up. Okay, <laughs> hold on. One down here in the top of the second. Off speed curls in, but it's high in the zone. 1-0, batting here is Latonia, the left fielder for Mercyhurst. And that was a clear breaking ball. I could see that from up here. <laughs> this one moves inside. Looks like I might have caught the umpire a little bit near his foot, so it'll be 2-0. Senchak now down 2-0 in the count. One out here top of the second, looking to keep Mercier's off the board. Next pitch out of the zone, 3-0. And, and do you give the green light here to Latona if he's going to maybe get a pitch in the zone, Danny? I mean, I would think so. Uh, unfortunately, there results in a walk. Yeah, it looked like it might have been low, a ball four, so Latona gets on base. First walk today for Senchak. We're going to see Colin Fantaski. That's a fantastic name, I got to say. <laughs> the right fielder coming up for Mercyhurst. Looks like we might see a sack bunt situation here. And we will. Fantaski gets it across, throws right to Senchak. Doesn't roll quick enough, though. Senchak on to first, and he's saved. They're going to third base. Kraus there gets the throw, and he is out because he slid off the base. What a heads-up play by Waszczak to go back to third. Yeah, and there goes the the, the sliding thing. Uh, it worked out for for Vulcan, for the Vulcans. Uh, Mercy here is just over sliding there and uh, results in a, in a thrown out of the lead runner. And I think that Latona was out before he even slid over the bag, but even if he hadn't, Kraus was there, and after he slid over it, would have been able to get the tag down. So a big play, now two outs with the top of the lineup, Cox back up. Pitch inside, ball one. So Fantaski scored as a single. Latona does get the second, but Thrown out, going to third base. Senchak gets one in there for a strike, evens the count. 
And Laytona there, just a great bunt even. Um, kind of overlooked that because of what happened on that play, but a great placed bunt um, allowed him to get to first and, and kind of move the runner around. Thankfully, the, the Vulcans heads up play there, got the lead runner out. Sinchek's one and one, and this is fouled away, one and two the count now, maybe try and see another strikeout pitch here. But yeah, as I said, when that bunt first went, Sinchek kind of played back thinking it was gonna kind of speed up to him and get to him, but it stopped on the turf, so he had to move up to it. One and two the count, two outs, top of the second. Cox up to bat for Mercyhurst, and he will sky one out into the gap between right and center. This will probably get the run home. Fennell over quickly. He gets the relay in. Brooks going to th not throw home, holds on to it, and it's 2 nothing Lakers. Yeah, and the Vulcans seem to be holding, not really, holding the runners, sorry, not really just rocketing one in there. Um, you know, you really want to kind of move that, the guy on second into a scoring position in third. Uh, but just, just a great hit by the Lakers into the gap. Fennell, unfortunately, could not get over there in time. It looked like the ball was even roping towards the right whenever it, it was hit. So, uh, you know, the Vulcans now down by two. Two nothing now the score. Mercer with four hits today. And Cox has been on base both times he's been up. The first time with an E6, this time a RBI double to the gap. First pitch is outside for ball one as we see it. And a long J back up to the plate for Mercyhurst. Here's the pitch from Senchak, and this one goes high in the zone, 2-0. and oh. And Senchak, he had hit a 1-2 and two count, and just Cox, a great job fighting that one off, going the opposite field into the gap, and I could tell that one was getting down as soon as it left the bat. There was nobody there. Next pitch in there for a strike, 2-1 and one the count now. Yeah, and Senchak really trying to stretch out this strike zone. Um, like I said before, trying to feel out where he, his pitches will be called strikes and where they won't be. Um, so, you know, you got a question here what the Lakers are going to do in the situation, see what, see what they can do. Line drive to the shortstop, Logan. He has it, and California gets out of the inning, only letting up one yet again. But could have possibly gone out of that without giving up any damage, but Cox a big RBI double with two outs. You see the line drive there, two shorts up to end the inning. Coming up for the Vulcans will be Webb, Yorgo, and Logan to lead it off. And Senchak got out of another inning, like you said, Zach. And uh, he's throwing the pitches in there. Uh, it was kind of similar to how the game uh, started the first game yesterday. Uh, with their throwing the pitches in there, the Lakers are just taking advantage of these opportunities. Um, in the last inning, uh, you know, the Vulcans took advantage of an opportunity in the first inning, the, the Lakers took advantage of an opportunity. So anything they can do, the Vulcans can do it better, it seems like. And uh, as you can see here on your screen, um, Fennel just average uh, runs, home runs, RBI, you know, it's all over the board. And uh, fielding uh, Jack Dennis uh, ERA is extremely low well, for the Vulcans in, in, this, in this season with a 4.1. Um, so, you know, this team has a lot of standouts. Um, but they also have team uh, players that are just trying to do their best to help the team win. Yeah, that 4.18 ERA by uh, Jack Dennis. We're not going to see him here today because he started yesterday against Mercyhurst, uh, the lowest in terms of the starting pitchers. And yeah, that's actually not that bad. You see a lot of four or five ERAs in the American League pitchers in the majors. Um, in the National League, you see more like threes and twos because of the pitcher hitting. Uh, but you know, DH lineups like they have in college you're going to see more american league style play not a lot of small ball more a lot of runs driven on to the scoreboard we're going to see christian webb leading it off here for the vulcans left-handed hitter which to the pitch from nasinski and it's in there for a strike going one and when i say it's a low era it might kind of sound like ignorant kind of, um, but thinking of how, how these balls are, are, are played uh, with more of an offensive game, only four four runs allowed, that's that's pretty good. Next pitch outside for ball one. Nisinski, he's quick. Every time he gets the ball back, he's ready to throw his next pitch. Here it is, and it's down low, two and one. Vulcan's maybe gonna try and throw him off his rhythm. Get him into the stretch a little bit more like they did with Fennell. Got on base, but he was quickly wiped off in the double play. Webb grounds one of the shortstop. And he has to cock his throw again, but he gets it on to first base for the out. 
and Christian Webb as many of the other Vulcans are today, just trying to do anything they could possibly do to, to get runners on. Um, this team can hit the ball, and uh, they're just trying to get started, and uh, getting runners on base is the first thing you gotta do, it's the first step. That was Bayego who made the play for the Lakers. Your goal. First pitch fouled back to the screen, 0-1. And we were doing softball this this past week. Uh, we were sitting right behind there, and, and I know when, when those balls come up and hit that hit that, <laughs> that screen, it kind of makes me jump back, even though I know there's a screen there. You know it's there, and you know you're going to be protected. But now a ground ball to the right side. Nasinski moves over. That's PFP to its perfection. Pitchers fielding practice as the out is recorded. And covering that base, it looked like it was going to go right into the gap. But uh, the first baseman, great job there getting over to the ball and the pitcher covering first base. And, you know, Yorgo tried his best to, to kind of extend that play, but unfortunately just got called out. And I appreciate Austin Logan's walk-up song. It's the theme to Friends. I can appreciate that. I, I, I'm definitely a Friends fan. I know we have a few of them on our crew here today and heard that song and it kind of made me happy. <laughs> first pitch in there, 0-1 for a strike. Now Logan pops it up. Second baseman's gonna call it off, and that is the third out. So California not able to get anything going yet on offense. We will see the, when they come back up to bat in the bottom of the third, as the lineup starts to turn over, will they do anything? California looks to hold Mercier's in the upcoming inning when we return on CTV. Cal U's six on-campus residence halls and Vulcan Village's garden-style apartment complex, University Housing offers the very best value in service, convenience, privacy, and security. On-campus students will have easy access to classrooms, the newly renovated Natalie Student Center, and a variety of activities across campus. University Housing Properties includes all utilities. Other common amenities to all properties are fully furnished rooms, high-def cable TV, high-speed Wi-Fi access, and live-in professional staff. Vulcan Village also includes a full kitchen and laundry room. The property has a 24-7 fitness center, convenient shuttle service, and an outdoor seasonal saltwater pool. Model rooms and tours are available. Stop in the University Housing Office or contact us by phone or email to learn more. And welcome back to Falcone Field. And you see the lights there. Not on right now. And next weekend, though, against UPJ here at Consol Energy Park, they will be as California and UPJ will be taking part in the Twilight Series. Games start at 4 and 7 next Friday night here at Consol Energy Park. Make sure you come out to support the Vulcans. And that's actually kind of different than what a lot of college teams do. They don't play a lot of night games unless you're in Division One. You play Friday and Saturday and Sunday nights. Um, but you know, Division Two, it's rare to see night games, Danny. Yeah, you know, the stars come out when the lights are out. Or lights are on. <laughs> Mess that up. <laughs> I knew it was set up. No, um, but we can see here uh, what the, the, the stars that come out for the Vulcans and also UPJ. You know, Danny, they always try to keep it lit on the field, so, you know. <laughs> this pitch popped up straight in the air. Webb going back for it. And he has a nice play near the screen for the out. And it's weird with this overcast here today because I know the last time when uh, Cal hit that ball to uh, the second baseman, the shortstop was in the shade, but the second baseman was in the bright sun. Um, so, you know, it's kind of hard to not only judge where the ball's going to be at, but also the, the sun can kind of play in factor with that. As a former outfielder myself, I played right field a lot. During sunshine games, I didn't mind it as much. At night, that's when it got me because the ball, you know, if you get a lot of dirt on the ball, uh, and there's a lot of clouds, or it's really dark overhead, not a lot of lighting, you can lose the ball really easily. That's what affected me more. During the daytime games, I was perfectly fine. I enjoyed playing the outfield. At night, I was kind of a little bit more timid, afraid of losing the ball. Ground ball here to Logan, throws on to first and gets the out, so quick two outs here for California. As you said there, like you were talking about how you played in the outfield, like I did, I played in the outfield as well, um, also second base, but the, the sun kind of bothered me. Um, I know most of these guys out here have those, those sunglasses, Oakleys, and all that stuff, yeah. like they're wearing those high-tech stuff. I never really had glasses out in the outfield. I never really 
use them. I don't really like sunglasses, but that kind of hurt my eyes, so I didn't really like the sun. <laughs> First pitch here outside and down into the turf, 1-0. and And yeah, I was one of those guys, I had my pair of Oakleys. I still have them nowadays. I actually use them as my regular sunglasses now most of the time. Uh, and they did give a lot of coverage, especially if it's a really sunny day. As you see the ground ball to second here, and a quick one, two, three inning for California, just what they needed. But sometimes it could throw you off, especially if, like I said before, if the ball is getting covered in dirt a lot and it's not been replaced a lot by the umpire, then you're gonna be a little bit harder to see. So it's kind of one of those comfort feels, like you said. Yeah, and, and these guys up here at this Division II level, even they have so much more experience. Um, and you know, they're, they're doing their best out there in the outfield. I just see the stat ranking here uh, with averages and ERA. Um, Mercyhurst has number one in the ERA department and also in fielding percentages. And uh, you know, this Mercyhurst team is leading the PSAC West and uh, Coach Conti tells his guys, you know, you can't circle one game on the schedule. You have to really look of every single team on the schedule as even strength um, because once you look over one team, you know, they can really bite you. And uh, the Cal has done a great job this year of not overlooking anyone, playing their best, playing their competitive baseball every single week. And, uh, you know, with a good record, a solid record, uh, top three in, in the PSAC West, see if they can kind of sneak into the playoffs even and, and, make some, and do some damage in the PSAC. Yeah, and Coach Conley, before the game, I asked him, you know, are you trying to fire your guys up a little bit more? Are they fired up more? Because it is Mercyhurst. They are the leaders in the division. He said... You know, it's up to them to fire themselves up. My job as a coach is to when we're playing a team that record-wise maybe isn't that good, like a Clarion or a Slippery Rock who are near the bottom of the division, it's my job to fire them up for that because I don't want to have them low off and we lose a game we shouldn't have on paper. Mm -hmm. First pitch here from Nasinski is called on the outside corner for a strike. We have Jared Grove up to bat. You have Grove, Thompson, and Kraus here in the bottom of the third. Next pitch, exact same spot, and Grove not happy with that call. He's like, that pitch is in the batter's box. How are you going to call that on me? And I agree, but the strike zones in college baseball are a lot more expanded than they are in the pros. Here's the 0-2. This one outside, and Nasinski is trying to go right back to that spot and maybe see if he can get another call. Yeah, it looks like he's just trying to paint that corner. Um, maybe even like a millimeter off. I, it, I can't really see from this vantage point. Now Grove drives one into the gap and it will be caught by the left fielder though. Nice rangy play out there for the first out. Yeah, and Grove, unfortunately it looked like it was going to be a gap hit. And uh, just that left fielder out there for Mercyhurst, just a great way of getting over there. And uh, that's Lanta. So yeah, just a great job of getting over there and, and, and catching that ball out there. Now Bobby Thompson up to bat for the Vulcans, the right fielder. This one, Sky down the left field side, out of play. And, you know, Bobby Thompson, kind of uh, playing right field, kind of reminds me of Bobby Higginson, who used to play for the Tigers back in the early 2000s, just the name and the position and stuff. And he has also a left-handed hitter as well. You see a pitch here, dive out of the zone, ball one. 2-0 the score, or 2 nothing. excuse me, the score. California still without a hit so far in this ball game. This one inside ball two. Thompson watches it go by. Yeah, and Asinski keeps trying to paint that corner low. Um, and the Vulcan hitters really need to, to take that into consideration and see what they can do and get their hips around and see if they can get something out of it. Now Thompson grounds it right back to Nasinski and he throws on the first four of the easy out. And that pitch even with the ball hitting that turf extremely hard. Um, I, I don't. I have not seen a game played on turf. Um, I remember when the Expos played, uh, that there was the turf field. Um, even I think there was a, a mixture of, was it dirt or was it all turf? Do you remember? I think it was all turf. Uh, I think it was an all turf. Um, we see strike in here. Uh, against Kraus, but yeah, it was an all-turf field up in Montreal, and it's weird. It plays a lot more faster than it does on dirt and grass. Kraus, foul ball over here, goes into the stands. It'll be an 0-2 count now, but and you mentioned the Montreal Expos. You know, there is talks that 
They may come back one day in the next few years, and I am a huge proponent of that. I loved when the Montreal Expos were a team, then they moved to the, become the Nationals. I would not mind seeing another team up in Montreal. And that was the only turf field to finish what I was saying. That's the only turf field that I remember. Never played on a turf field. I don't know how the ball reacts bouncing up. Um, like what we talked about with Conti, how it's more of like a carpet even feel. Here's the one, two count, and the pitch skied into the gap. It's down four extra bases as Kraus will stand at second with the first hit for the Vulcans today and brings up Mick Fennell to maybe drive him in. Yeah, it was a great job at the bottom of the order to get some production out of him and a great hit. Uh, it might have even hit the warning track, so just way to get your hips around and just rocket one out there to, uh, to left center. Yeah, I thought this might have gone over the fence for a ground rule double, but it stayed in just barely. And back to the all turf fields, up until this season, the Blue Jays had turf field. They had dirt around the base pass. This season, though, they moved to a dirt infield for the first time. They still have turf out in the outfield, though. Uh, so they kind of have a modified design of what we have here at Console Energy Park. It's interesting. I mean, there's less of a maintenance uh, concern when it comes to turf. Um, there's there's not much that you have to do really to maintain it. Um, I mean, obviously, most of these teams that have turf have covered like they're, they're like in a dome yeah. basically, so they don't really have to worry about like the water issues and stuff like that. But it, it's definitely smart. I mean, I don't know how the players like it, but. In this first pitch outside, ball one to Fennell, who walked his first time. Up until Krause's hit, he was the only base runner for the Vulcans. And you see a lot of turf on football fields nowadays. I know where I'm from in Georgia, it is required. And this one gets away, a pass ball from the catcher, and Krause will move up to third base. An easier opportunity now to maybe get him home on a base hit. But back where I was saying, football fields in Georgia, where I'm from in Marietta, you have to have a turf field. Um, that's a rule in the GHSA. Um, you must have turf because of the maintenance costs that come with grass. 2-0 no count here, two outs, bottom of the third. Fennell up to bat, and he'll hit one up the middle, and there's the first run for the Vulcans. And great job there, Fennell. As I said before, on base percentage, very high for the Vulcans team leader. And uh, just a great shot right near the second base. And, uh, you know, score one, get back in this game uh, with two hits now. Just exploding now, see what he can do with the top of the order up, Garrett Brooks. And uh, Mick Fennell, as we said before, he's also, a, he, he likes to steal bases. So um, with two outs, see if they can kind of take a risk here and what they could do. Brooks, first time up the bat, line into that shortstop, the first base double play. First pitch here, he'll ground one over to shortstop, makes a nice diving play, he's gonna have to hurry quickly. And he's safe, what a play though. I gotta say, he might be safe, but that might have been a tie, and tie goes to the runner, but what a play by the shortstop. Yeah, and Morrison even at first base, you have to mention him as well. Um, he's stretched. When I say stretched, that is a just, it doesn't, basically it doesn't give any credit to what he did because he fell after and looking that. Looking at that shot right there for a second, it looked like his foot might have come off the bag, which is why he was called safe at first, um, Brooks. Now first and second, two outs. You got Chris Waschek up, leads the team in RBIs this year. Maybe an opportunity to pad his team lead now. Nasinski gonna step off the mound, go and talk with his shortstop. That is Baega, who made just a fantastic play, getting the diving stop, and I, I said he was gonna have to hurry and get that throw over, and he did, a cannon of an arm. We'll see now what comes of this. Wash check up to bat. Waschak grounds one down the first baseline over the Mercer's dugout, 0-1. See if uh, Waschak can maybe hit one in the gap. Um, the short, uh, second baseman is playing a little bit back, and uh, shortstop, of course, watching uh, Fennell over there on second base. And, of course, with two outs, runners are going to get going, so if you hit one deep enough, as you see a striker on the outside corner here, if you hit one deep enough into the gap, you could see both runs score. But now in this opportunity to 0-2, Washek's just gonna fight to stay alive, maybe just bloop one out to the outfield. Nasinski looking to get out of the inning, an 0-2 count here to Washek. Washek skies one, deep, down the line, it's gonna curl foul, and into the bullpen. Looked like 
the catch was almost made. I couldn't tell off that. It looked like it, the, it might have hit the come off the screen. No out recorded here. Yeah, and the Lakers, like you said, it hit into the bullpen. The Lakers guys sitting in the bullpen, really, they saw that ball coming towards them. They all scattered. Yeah. Um, I didn't even know who was the right fielder and who was in the bullpen. It was it's kind one of, of those a, instances like, oh, that's coming at us. I guess <laughs> we should move. Uh-oh. <laughs> Yeah, that's, I'm not a big fan of bullpens on the foul lines because of that reason. It kind of interferes with play and me being an outfielder, I didn't like it. Now 0-2 again. Waschek grounds it to the shortstop, Baega. He's going to have to hurry on to first, and he gets the out. So Waschek not able to get another run across. But the Vulcans, they cut that lead in half for Mercyhurst. It's now 2-1. to one. And when we come back for the fourth inning, we're about halfway through this game almost. Still a close contest. We'll see now, anything can happen. The offense for California has come to play when we return on CUTV. With Cal U's six on-campus residence halls and Vulcan Village's garden-style apartment complex, University Housing offers the very best value in service, convenience, privacy, and security. On-campus students will have easy access to classrooms, the newly renovated Natali Student Center, and a variety of activities across campus. University housing properties includes all utilities. Other common amenities to all properties are fully furnished rooms, high-def cable TV, high-speed Wi-Fi access, and live-in professional staff. Balkan Village also includes a full kitchen and laundry room. The property has a 24-7 fitness center, convenient shuttle service, and an outdoor seasonal saltwater pool. Model rooms and tours are available. Stop in the University Housing Office or contact us by phone or email to learn more. Welcome back to Consol Energy Park. The California Vulcans strike for one run in the bottom of the third off three hits. Leave a couple men on, but the lead now only two to one in favor of Mercyhurst, who have Baega leading off the inning and miraculous play at shortstop so far from him, but Senchak gonna look to maybe strike him out again. One, two, three inning last time for Senchak. First pitch, wild pitch here for Senchak. As Baiego kind of threw that drag bunt across at the last second, might have thrown Senchak off. Yeah, and it, that bunt, the showing bunt kind of gets the the pitcher to kind of throw it a little bit lighter so the, the bunt doesn't really do much, and, and that was a strategic move from, from the Lakers there. Second pitch is down in the zone, ball two. California looking to maybe get back on offense quickly and maybe see if they can wear Nasinski down. Here's the pitch, ground ball in between the shortstop and third base, the five hole on the infield, if you'll call it. It'll be a single here for Baega. Yeah, it was a great placed hit, unfortunately, for Senchak. Uh, Merseyhurst getting runners on base with five hits on the day already. Um, you know, Vulcans really have to try to limit those. Uh, that was just a great placed hit, like I said there, um, in the five hole, as you said. <laughs> and the master of the five hole over there, Tony Gwynn. Uh, and then we can see a sack bunt here. Senchak gets it, he'll go on to first for the easy flip out and one out, one on second. Uh, but the master of the, the hit between short and third was Tony Gwynn and when he unfortunately passed away from cancer a few years back, the Padres, instead of putting his number in the outfield where he played, they put it right in that spot. They put the 19 right there because that was where he hit all the time, and he was a left-handed hitter, so he was always driving the opposite way. One out, runner on second now. Laytona coming up to bat. He walked his first time and got thrown out at third base on a bunt single from, from Tasky. That heads up play from Waschak and Kraus. Yeah, just a great job there from Waschak, you know, taking his time and uh, and, and bringing that, that pitch in uh, from Senchak. Want to know the count now? Here's the pitch. Laytona watches in there for a strike. One ball, one strike, one out. Top of the fourth. Laytona at least looking to move that runner over to third base. Bring up Fantaski with two outs. Here's the pitch. 
Laytona watches in there for a high strike. That one was high from my vantage point. It looked like it might have just been a little bit caught the zone just enough for that call. Now the one and two count here against Laytona. Senchak looking to get out of the inning yet again without letting up any runs. You just scored one. You don't want to give up another. Here's the pitch. Laytona grounds it in between the hole. Grove going to come up throwing. He goes to the plate. Here it is, the throw, and not in time. Webb drops it. It looked like he might have had him if he got it because Webb was blocking the plate. But the run comes in to score. Laytona goes to second on the throw, an RBI single there. Yeah, and Webb doing a great job of blocking the plate. As you can see here on our replay, Grove coming up just fires one in, and it was a great throw. It was on time. Webb just was thinking about tagging the runner before even just bringing the ball in. Um, so it was a great play by Grove out there in left field. Um, just unfortunately for Christian Webb, could not bring that, that ball in and, and tag the runner. Three to one the score now. California strikes for a run, but they let one quickly back up. Fantastic at the plate now, grounds it. Senchek off his bare hand. Logan gonna make the bare hand play on to first. Not in time, Waschek watches it get away. And Laytona's gonna come around to score on the error. So Mercyhurst, beneficiaries of a couple erratic plays here from California, increase their lead. Yeah, and this is something that Coach Conti was telling us before, um, that you know, Mercyhurst taking advantage of the opportunity, um, like they did in the first inning, getting that one run. Uh, but just not really sloppy play, just unfortunate play for the Vulcans, um, overthinking, not really taking their time and, and getting those plays that they're supposed to. Um, but it might have been a, re a routine play there if Senchak didn't deflect that ball with his offhand, like you said. Um, but, you know, just try to stick with it. And uh, Waschak over there, unfortunately, could not handle the ball. And like I said, it went off his bare hand, and that is his throwing hand. So he's going to get a few warm-up pitches to see how he is. Well, at least on that one, he looked fine, but that's always a dangerous play. We'll see here. And you said that he might have been able to just like a routine ground ball, maybe. That is instinct, though, from Senchak to get that throw in. The error there on Waschak, not able to pick that one out of the ground uh, and caused the runner to come home. I don't even think that Waschak would have even got a, a that pitch to be out. I don't even know if that runner would have yeah. been out in that situation. I think it would have been even. safe and maybe just a better play would have been for Logan to hold it. But he looked like he probably thought he had an opportunity to get it out over there. Now runner on first, one out. 0-1 count now to Cox, the leadoff hitter in the second baseman for Mercier, stuff for the third time. Pitch to second baseman Brooks, he dives, he's not able to stop it. Fennell gonna come up, he's gonna throw to third. Kraus gets it, and he's safe, as looked like Fantaski almost slid off the bag. Kraus can't believe that he didn't get that out call. Now be first and third here for the Lakers. Yeah, Fantaski just looked like, as you can see here, Fennell just coming up throwing and just has a cannon of an arm. I that didn't even think that would have been throw, even close. Yeah. And it looked like when Fantaski was kind of putting his arm out, it looked like he came off the base just a little bit. And uh, that's why Krause over there just was thinking like, I got that call, but unfortunately he didn't. Yeah, and the umpire was right there to make that call. So we're gonna give him the benefit of that. His eyes were right on top of the play. And it looked like the tag was just slightly late though. Now a high bunt, this one's gonna be popped up. Webb's gonna go back for it. So a very bad bunt attempt results in a quick second out. And Mercer is now down to first and third with two outs. Yeah, and something different. Um, the Vulcans don't really bunt in, in uh, situations like this. You know, they like to hit and run in that situation. And uh, something that the Lakers do a little bit different. Senchak's pitch here, outside, 1-0, but you know, that bunt situation here, I don't even know if maybe it was going to be a suicide squeeze, but the runner at third quickly stopped, so I don't know if that was going to be a suicide or not, but very poor bunt. Now a line drive into the gap here. What a shot. Grove, now he's going to let Fennell get it. Fennell throws it in. Logan's just gonna have to hold it as two runs come across to score. It's six to one Lakers. Yeah, and the Lakers are just finding their pitches and just executing um, something that they do game in and game out. 
and uh, you you can't really discredit the Vulcans in this situation. Um, you know, their their defense might have been a little bit off, but what can you do? Um, you really just have to just gather yourself and uh, just think about the next play, think about the next pitch that's going to be thrown in. Two outs here, six to one to score now. Senchak's first pitch, fouled back to the screen, and we this may be the end of Senchak's day after he gets out of this inning. We may see another pitcher come in, and it looks like there is one warming up in the bullpen now. Can't see who that is. Looks like it's number 19 for the Vulcans. That is Caleb Catherine, a junior from South Williamsport. Off speed, high and out of the zone, evens account. And Senchak just trying to do anything he can uh, just to get out of this inning. You know, you don't really want to give up much more. Four runs in one inning, you just kind of limit those uh, so you can get, allow your offense to kind of get back into this contest. Here's the one and one. Now this one, a fly ball deep to center field. Fennell's going to go back on it. He's going to watch it go out of the park. Two run home run. It makes it eight to one Lakers. And, you know, he found his pitch there. Uh, 405 into deep center. And uh, it looked like it kind of skied over, maybe even a 425-foot home run there. Um, you know, the Vulcans just really got to just come back together. Uh, they might be maybe seeing even Catherine come in relatively sooner than we thought. Uh, it looks like no change is going to come out for the Vulcans. I think Coach Conti, knowing that this is his last it's his senior day, he's going to let him finish this inning. And I agree with that decision. He's got to get one more out. Uh, it's eight to one, get one more out, then you make the change. You don't want to make the change right in the middle of an inning. I, I don't think a lot of coaches like doing that. They like to have guys finish the inning and get a, a whole new start. Uh, but California, this bottom of the fourth, they got to get the offense going uh, if they're going to stay in this one. Ground ball to Brooks, the second baseman. He'll throw on to first for the final out. Almost a wild throw, though. Uh, but California gets out of it. They let up six runs in that inning, so another just big inflated inning from Mercier, similar to yesterday's game one, and California's offense gonna come back with a charge here. Yeah, and as I keep referencing, um, talking to Coach Conti before this game, uh, he was nice enough to sit down with uh, all three of our announcers as uh, Anthony Diagostino will be joining us uh, in the second game. He sat down with all of us, really went over what has been going on this season for the Vulcans and also talking about last game when they played the Lakers. And in that talk, he was talking about uh, kind of how the Lakers started out, um, how everybody got everything going and how the game kind of went down. And you see right there our YouTube page, CUTV Sports 1. If you want to go back and watch this game or the second game, or any of the other baseball games we've done in years past, go to CUTV Sports 1 to watch all the baseball action here from the California Vulcans. And like you mentioned, Danny, Coach Connie talked with us before the game. Every year that we come here, uh, he talks with us beforehand. I really appreciate that. And you know, we both play baseball, so we understand kind of what he's talking about. But for some of our announcers that come here, like Anthony, you're not the biggest baseball guy, but you understand a, a little bit enough of it. But really talking to Coach Conti really helps us understand the team more because we're not able to come out here and see them all the time. Uh, being 30 minutes away, it's hard to follow them, uh, except for scoreboards that we do on News Center. Yeah, and, and not only just that, but also what he does as a coach. It might be a little bit unorthodox what he does as uh, he doesn't really like to bunt a lot. So that, that's also different. It's something that we really appreciate him doing uh, before this game started. Webb here to lead it off for the Vulcans. He grounded out to the shortstop his first time up. Watches one down low, evens count at one. As I said, something different that Coach Conti does um, that not, not many other coaches, uh, not only in the PSAC, but also coaches around the, the nation do differently in situations. And I think it's something that it gives more freedom to the players on his team also to have confidence in them that they can do what, they, what they're out to do. Webb grounds one up the middle. Montea, what a play. That's actually a Baiega, excuse me. What a play. He has really impressed me. Looking like Angelton Simmons all the defensive plays he's making. Yeah, and Baiega came over and even took that bounce. It looks like he called the second baseman off, just got his glove out, speedy play there. Um, as they say on Baseball Tonight, uh, Web Gem. <laughs> yeah, Web Gem nominee right there. And 
<laughs> Speaking of web gems, it's been a couple years now. Uh, we had a play uh, mentioned on Bleacher Report, the Fox Sports, the One Countdown, and Intentional Talk and MLB Network, where um, we had a fly ball to right field. There's a ground ball here to second for what is sticking out from your goal. But fly ball to right field. Chuck Gasty made a miraculous catch against the fence, ranging all the way over to grab it. Got his foot stuck in the fence. Looked like he might have gotten hurt, but luckily he was not. And what a great play it was. Yeah, and Joe Yergel there, just trying to do anything to get base runners on. And, you know, the mercy here is the, the Lakers are just getting all these uh, pitches to fall for them. See what the Vulcans can do. Logan grounds to Baega, and it cannot be picked by the first baseman, Morrison. That'll be an E3 on the play. And it looked like everybody in the infield kind of was looking to go back into the dugout. Just looked like a bang-bang play here. As you can see in the corner of your screen, the third baseman was even coming in and uh, just couldn't, Morrison just couldn't get that. Look, even looked down at his glove like, what's going on? <laughs> glove, you have failed me, why? <laughs> Um, yeah, so an E3 there for Morrison. We'll put Logan at first and Grove coming up to bat. He lined out to the left fielder his first time on a nice hit. First one in there for a strike, 0 and 1. Nasinski ready for the 0 1 pitch. It's in, and Grove fouls it off. 0-2 oh, the count now. And as you said, Grove the last time he was up, just a, a fly ball to left field. And, and the Vulcans are getting the bat on the ball. They're doing what, they, what they're what they supposed to do. It's just they're not getting those those falls. They're not getting the, the, the pitches that they want to, to actually equate into any, any production. 0-2 oh, the count here. Nasinski with the pitch. And it's high and outside, ball one. Great take there, kind of extending this at bat. Uh, one and two count now with two outs. Um, see what, what Coach Conti does here. He even sends the runner, kind of gets the Lakers to, to get off, off their game. Here's the one, two, and Grove drives it to right field. Line drive, and it's caught. And a nice sliding play by the right fielder, Grove. Great contact both times up to the bat. Nothing out of it, though, like you said. And I said during the open, kind of atom balls and they're going right at the defenders. California not able to muster anything there, even with the error. Still eight to one Lakers. We'll be back for the top of the fifth on CU TV. Cal U's six on-campus residence halls and Vulcan Village's garden-style apartment complex, University Housing offers the very best value in service, convenience, privacy, and security. On-campus students will have easy access to classrooms, the newly renovated Natali Student Center, and a variety of activities across campus. University Housing Properties includes all utilities. Other common amenities to all properties are fully furnished rooms, high-def cable TV, high-speed Wi-Fi access, and live-in professional staff. Vulcan Village also includes a full kitchen and laundry room. The property has a 24-7 fitness center, convenient shuttle service, and an outdoor seasonal saltwater pool. Model rooms and tours are available. Stop in the University Housing Office or contact us by phone or email to learn more. And we are back. Caleb Catherine sporting the nice mustache on the mound is now in the pitch for the Vulcans. As Senchak's day is done, he went four innings, gave up eight runs, seven of them earned. Had one walk and two strikeouts, gave up 10 hits as well, faced 23 batters. We're going to see Baega come up to bat here for the Lakers. He has singled and struck out and also came around to score the last time he was up to bat. Actually, he led off last inning as well as Mercier has almost batted around. First pitch is low for ball one. 
This is my first broadcast here um, at Console Energy Park, and just a great day for baseball as as the Vulcans take on a doubleheader against the Lakers. Yeah, when that pitch was in there for a strike, it seems every time we come out for baseball, thankfully, it's been a nice day. It's been the spring weather that you enjoy. When baseball season is around, now a fly ball out to center field. Fennell going to go to the gap. He will watch it go over his head for an extra base hit. Fennell going to throw it in, and Baega will stop at second with a double. And Fennell's arm kind of limiting the, the Lakers' ability to get extra base hits out of those. Um, it was a clear double opportunity. Uh, but Fennell, if, if he didn't get that pitch in there faster, you know, that could have been a, a triple even. Um, so his, his ability to just get the ball into the cutoff, uh, kind of limiting the Lakers' ability to get extra base hits. We're going to see DiNardo come up to bat. He has a sacrifice bunt and a ground out to third base on his record today. Catherine's pitch is sky to the outfield. This one is deep and gone. Or no, excuse me, no. It hit off the wall out there in left field. And they're actually calling a home run, though. I did go over the yellow. It did go over the yellow line. And we'll see. Because there is a fence back there. We'll see right here, the ball. Yeah, it hit the advertising fence above the wall. I thought that wall was in play, and then I looked down to see the yellow line. So a two-run jack here for DiNardo makes it 10 to 1. Yeah, and, and the ref on the first base line here, uh, just kind of standing right in, in front of second base, just kind of you know twirling his finger and saying, that was a home run, and unfortunate yet again to extend the Lakers' lead to now 10 to 1. One another count now. Catherine pitching to Laytona. Laytona swings and misses there. We've not seen a lot of those today for the Lakers. They have put the bat on the ball, it seems, almost every time. Only a couple strikeouts today for them, and they've both been looking. So when they're not swinging, they don't think it's necessarily a pitch they should swing at. Now ball here, two and one. Yeah, and the first at bat for the Lakers is inning. Baiego just hits a, a great shot to center field, and then back to back and, and DiNardo just a, a home run and scores both of them. So, you know, hopefully Catherine can kind of keep his composure, um, focus on the next batter, uh, don't really think about the past, just work on the batter in front of you. We're seeing Cam Maxey, a senior in the bullpen, and Laytona drives one, but this will go foul. It had the distance, maybe, and looked like it might have tailed off a little bit at the end, but definitely a deep drive down the left field line. and. Danny, I, I don't know if this was something you said around your team. Every time you hit a foul, what could have been a home run, you seem to strike out the next time. We'll see if that works here for Catherine. 3-2 count, here's the pitch. And it's outside for a ball four. Yeah, and like you said, that I said the same thing whenever it was whenever I played. And, uh, you know, could, could not get that strikeout there. Um, but Catherine now, the pitching coach coming out to talk to him. And that is actually Coach Conti, it looks like, maybe taking the ball from his pitcher. And he will as Caleb Catherine comes in. Zero plus innings. We're going to see Cam Maxey, the senior, come in. And wait till you see his delivery, um, Danny. I was watching it out in the outfield on the foul bullpen. Um, and he kind of has that kind of submarine sidearm delivery. Yeah, those are always different to see, uh, not only in the MLB, but also in in game, uh, also the minor leagues and stuff like that. I know the Harrisburg Senators, by me, uh, different deliveries also can throw off the batters. Um, it's always different when you see a submarine pitcher throw a ball in there because you don't know if it's if it's going to be high, you don't know if it's going to be low, and but the breaking pitch kind of takes it off, uh, gives them more of an advantage, uh, the batter even. And we're going to look at the home run now that caused the pitching change here for the Vulcans as Tenardo skied it out, hit the advertising screen out in left center field near the scoreboard, made it a 10-1 ball game. We're going to see Laytona at first base here, Maxi coming in.
and the senior pitcher coming in even. So uh, we'll see what he can do. And this will be interesting uh, with no outs, just trying to get out of this inning. And as I said before, you know, just trying to get out of the defensive side of it and see if the offense can really uh, ramp it up for the Vulcans. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's always a challenge to come back in a game where you're, you're losing by five plus even. You know, just trying to create any production possible um, for your team is the key. Colin Fantaski coming up, the right fielder. And Coach Connie's out here talking to one of his players. Look at his Fennell. Not sure exactly what that was about. But going back to play now. So Maxi with a runner on first. No outs here in the top of the fifth. Steps in to face Fantaski. And here's that sidearm delivery, and ball goes inside. And for right-handed hitters, that's definitely a little bit of a different kind of delivery because those pitches all look like they're going to come right in and hit you, but they tail into the last second. Here's the 1-0. And fouled off the leg of Fantaski. Look like it'll be 1-1. One one. Those are always the worst when the ball bounces up and kind of clips you in the ankle. Um, yeah. It's kind of hard to stay in the box at that point. You know, your ankle's throbbing. Um, just trying to do something here for the Vulcans is, is Cam Maxey. Here's the pitch. Inside for a strike, though, as Fantaski just watching that one go by. Might have seen a little bit of a jitter there because of the way the pitch is being delivered. And the best thing here for Maxey, if he comes in, gets the ground ball for a double play. Here's the one and two. And outside for a strike. That is a strikeout. I don't even think the umpire knew it because he didn't make his strikeout call. But he is signaling that, yes, that was a strikeout. So one out here. Maxi comes in, gets the quick out. And Maxi, the senior pitcher as well, um, similar to how Senchak was. He's seen a lot of pitchers, probably not as much as Senchak, but he knows, he knows what he can do. Now this first pitch here for Maxi outside for ball one. And just a quick note, that runner on first base, Laytona, that is still Caleb Catherine's responsibility as he was the one that put him on. We have Cox, the top of the order, coming up for the Lakers. This one down and in, ball two. And the first pitch from Cam Maxi was, you normally say in the dirt, but here, I might say in the turf. <laughs> it's a little yeah. bit different, um, but you know you gotta play the way, I guess, what you normally say. Ball three inside, and you don't want to put Cox on because Elanger, he has a single today. He's actually been the one guy at the top of the Mercer's lineup that really hasn't done anything contributive-wise to runs on the board. Uh, but you still don't want to get this top of the lineup an opportunity. Now ball is in there for a strike, and the throw back to first is safe. Three and one the count now, still one out. And yeah, a three and one count, this is only the batter's uh, count in favor of the batter. He can really see if, if he sees a pitch he doesn't like and it's in there for a strike, he still has one uh, to stay alive. Now a fly ball to the gap. Looks like Grove has a play on it, and it drops at the warning track. Fennell quickly gets it in. Logan going to watch it bounce, and he fakes the throw. That's like three or four times that California has not continued the relay in. With the score being 11 to one now, at some point, just take the risk, I think. Yeah, and it looks like even the outfield was, uh, they're, they're allowing uh, Fennell to kind of take the take the, the cutoff throw, I guess, um, as you could say, because Grove had the, the better line on the ball, and he kind of just let Fennell take that ball and uh, kind of get it to the, the cutoff guy. And You know, it is a smart in the situation because uh, Fennell can, has a better arm, it seems, as though. Ball one outside, one out, runner at second, Elange up the bat, and the line is closed on Caleb Catherine. Now zero plus innings, gave him two hits, three runs all earned, no walks and no strikeouts. Excuse me, he had one walk. Now line drive, Brooks leaps up in the air and catches it, then I'll be out number two. Yeah, and Mercyhurst, smart in that way, uh, start in that respect, that they stay near the base, uh, that could have been a gap or just right over the second baseman's head, but the uh, runner on second, uh, just smart play there, Cox. 
Chris Gonzalez up to the plate now. He doubled last inning and brought a couple runs home and then was followed up by Morrison's home run, which extended his 16-game hitting streak. Two outs here. Here's Maxie's pitch, grounded foul down the left field line. Eleven to one, the score now in favor of the Lakers. It's very similar to Game One yesterday. California was able to come back and win the second of the Twin Bill. They'll hopefully, be able to come back and do that today. They still have some time to come back and win this game, though. Maxie's pitch outside for ball one. And with 15 hits in last contest, as you said, Game One uh, was eleven to one, and it's the similar uh, scene today. Uh, Mercyhurst, 13 hits today. Uh, with one error, and they're consistently getting these high-scoring games, and the Vulcans have to keep that in mind and, and try to limit this for the, for the remainder of this game. Now, a wild pitch here from Max. He goes wide of his catcher, Christian Webb. Two and one the count now when Cox moves over to third base. Two and one the count. Two outs, top of the fifth. And a line drive into the gap yet again. It seems every time the Lakers make contact with the ball, it's going towards the gap. This will be extra bases. Fennell plays it off the wall, gets the throw in, and limits Elanger to an RBI double. And just another unfortunate play for the Vulcans. Um, Cam Maxey now just trying to just keep his composure, really. Um, like I said before with the other pitchers today, just focus on the next batter in front of you. And uh, as well as everybody else out there on the defense for the Vulcans, just needs to stay in this game and uh, don't let it get away from them because, you know, that could be disastrous as the game is already 12 to 1. We're going to see Brandon Warner, a sophomore from Spring Grove, Pennsylvania, go up and warm in the pen now as Morrison watches one in there for a strike. And Brandon Warner on our roster sheet is listed as an infielder, not as a pitcher as well, but looks like he's going to get his opportunity to come in and throw. And this one tails outside for ball one. And as you said, Brandon Werner listed as a, uh, a, a infielder. Um, it, it's different than normal. I know that everybody on a team has a specific position that they play, and this Vulcans team is really, uh, as you see, they are third out. Um, but to finish what I was saying, they kind of have multiple. They're like very versatile in the sense that they can play a multitude of different positions, um, infielder, pitcher, uh, even a catcher-pitcher kind of thing, um, which is different from most teams that you can see. Yeah, I know all these rosters nowadays, it's not like you go in the majors where they have specific positions that each person plays. Here, you can move all around the diamond. As you see, a couple of uh, pets here at the park, Gonzalo Energy Park, and I guess, you know, it is where the wild things are, and I'm not saying that is a wild <laughs> dog by any instance, but uh, cute little puppy there enjoying the shade here at Consol Energy Park and maybe California, maybe their bass can come out in the sun and maybe light up uh, some metal and get some runs on the board. Is now our cameraman Ryan is pointing the camera over to us. We will give a wave over there. Is Danny, this is your first baseball game. This is my third now and unfortunately it is also my final broadcast with CUTV. Yeah, unfortunately, and it, it's really cool to come out to one of these games. Um, I know I write for uh, for our newspaper, Cal Times, and just seeing these these players that I always write about in person, it's definitely cool. Um, unfortunately, we're on the wrong side of the game here, 12 to one, uh, but it, it, it's really cool to see and come out to a, a great park uh, in Console Energy Park and just see see what's going on. Bobby Thompson will be leading off for the Vulcans here in the bottom of the fifth. He grounded out to the pitcher Nasinski his first time up. Nasinski's first pitch of the inning is outside, ball one. Thompson, number 17, waiting for the 1-0 pitch now. And it's in there for a strike. And Bobby Thompson trying to get something started at the bottom of the order for the Vulcans, as Krause did in the bottom of the third. Uh, so we can see 
here that Nasinski is still throwing that in there and, and getting those those called strikes. In the Mercyhurst bullpen, really no action down there. There's a couple guys moving around. I think just maybe trying to get up and maybe stretch their legs a little bit. So Nasinski looks like hits his game today as Thompson grounds one of the second baseman and a big hop right to him, gets the out. There's really no sense of taking Nasinski out in the situation. You know, he's just, he's doing a great job uh, limiting the Vulcans to only three hits today. And uh, something that Vulcans really need to keep in mind and, and try to play defense in a sense and, uh, and put some hits up on the board, get some runs up there as well. But the, just the base runners, they just really need to put base runners on and give them an opportunity to score. First pitch in for an outside strike to Levi Kraus, who had the Vulcans first hit back in the third inning and double, came around to score on a Fennell single. Now Kraus into the gap. It might stay up for the right fielder, and it does. And now they're out here for the Vulcans. It's two down, Fennell coming up. Yeah, it just seems like as many hits as the Vulcans are getting, they're just in the wrong spots. Right and at the players, it seems. Yeah, and even as you saw there, it just it looked as though it was going to be a gapper, and, and the outfielders just, just running over to it and stopping that from equating into anything. Nasinski's first pitch outside, and Nasinski, he is actually working so fast that the center fielder for Mercyhurst, he was not back over in his positioning yet. He was still running as Nasinski was throwing. And Fennell watches one high for ball two, but I remember in high school, our coach would always say, you know, wait till your guys are set before you make the pitch. You don't want to get out of position and have an easy base hit. Fennell watches one in there for a strike, two and one the count now. Yeah, kind of step back and and show everybody how many outs there are, and you know he just wants to keep rolling on. Fennell watches one for a strike, two and two now with two outs. Fortunately, got the call on the outside. It looked as though he was going to point down there, but he was actually pointing and saying that it was a strike. Here's a two and two, and Fennell watches it for an outside strike. It looked like it was in the other batter's box. Gets the call though, and Fennell not happy with it, but he goes down looking. So the Vulcans not able to capitalize on anything there and bring some runs back on the board. They go to the top of the six, down 12 to one on CUTV. Cal U's six on-campus residence halls and Vulcan Village's garden-style apartment complex, University Housing offers the very best value in service, convenience, privacy, and security. On-campus students will have easy access to classrooms, the newly renovated Natali Student Center, and a variety of activities across campus. University Housing Properties includes all utilities. Other common amenities to all properties are fully furnished rooms, high-def cable TV, high-speed Wi-Fi access, and live-in professional staff. Vulcan Village also includes a full kitchen and laundry room. The property has a 24-7 fitness center, convenient shuttle service, and an outdoor seasonal saltwater pool. Model rooms and tours are available. Stop in the University Housing Office or contact us by phone or email to learn more. And welcome back. You see Mike Mays. That is the second time this year he has dabbed on one of our broadcasts, enjoying the day out in the sun, a nice spring Saturday afternoon here, watching the Vulcans take on the Lakers. And he will be working camera the second game. We can't let him enjoy the afternoon entirely. We have to put a little bit of work uh, behind him as well. Second time he dabbed on camera. That has to be a record. I definitely is. <laughs> Ground ball to second base here. First pitch of the inning is an easy out as Brandon Warner is on the pitch. And that was Elliott who grounded out to Brooks. Yeah, I noticed that there was a different pitcher in there because I didn't see a submarine pitch thrown. Yeah. So it kind of switched up. I didn't realize that he came out, whereas we were watching Mike Mays over there do something crazy on camera. <laughs> Now coming up to bat is Baega, the shortstop for Mercyhurst. He has an RBI, or he has scored two runs. He's gotten on on a single and a double. He struck out his other time at bat. He's made a lot of great defensive plays today for Mercyhurst. 
This one in there for a strike. And Warner, he has a little bit of a different delivery as well. He kind of pauses himself and then throws the pitch. And this one, uh, line drive down the line. It'll be a quick bounce off the wall. Baega gonna go to second with a double. Yeah, and as, as much as it wasn't a, a needed play, he did go head first into second. Um, but like you said before, you have to really start your, your slide very early. And you can kind of see right before, um, kind of where the second baseman is standing right now, uh, Garrett Brooks, where, the, where the, it looks like they started their slide anyways. And uh, it's really prevalent. You can see it on this turf, the, the different the glare of, in the sun. Yeah. Warner's pitch to DiNardo is low, ball one. He also has a strike on him, it's one and one. I don't remember him throwing two pitches to DiNardo. And a ground ball. And now the count's one and two. I'm pretty sure that the count's, I'm pretty sure the count is only one and one though. Uh, we'll have to wait and see here though. I, I don't think he threw another pitch to a DiNardo before we saw that first ball. This one swung on and missed. So yes, the count will be one and two now as Donato would have took off for first base. So it's one and two now. The scoreboard had it wrong and they put one and three on the board. Now they have to reset, now it's one and two. But the runner, Baega, did advance on the passed ball. Now DiNardo waiting for the one and two pitch from Warner. And swung on and missed. DiNardo goes down swinging a nice pitch there. Only the third, or excuse me, the fourth strikeout today by a Laker batter. Yeah, I want to call that a changeup or any other breaking ball. From our vantage point, we really can't see the break on the ball. We can just see if they kind of swing behind it. Even just an off-speed pitch. Uh, got the Lakers guy to retire the side and see what he can do here with two outs. First pitch in there for a strike. Looking like that dip down in the zone. Might have been a little bit of a cutter there from Warner. Oh, and one the count to Laytona. Trying to strand that run at third. This one gets away from Webb. And Baega thought about coming home, but it wasn't far enough that would have given him opportunity to score. Vulcan's now going through a multitude of different pitchers in game one. You got to think that that takes a toll on their bullpen for game two. Um, we have to see who's going to be pitching, especially after a series just yesterday. That one in there for a high inside strike. One and two to count now. And we already see warming up in the bullpen, number 45, Thomas Chisholm, a freshman from Williamsburg, Virginia. The one and two, in there, swung on and missed. So Brandon Warner comes in and gets a couple guys down. Easy inning there, got a runner on, but left him stranded at third base. Yeah, and getting two strikeouts in that, uh, the, the first few batters that he's seen today, um, just is great from a young, a young pitcher like that. Um, but as you see here on your screen, our Facebook page, uh, California University Television, we have a multitude of different people on our crew that use Facebook. Um, one, I always have to say, our own Anthony Diagostino is a, a, a great user of Facebook. Has to be uh, Zuckerberg's favorite person on Facebook. <laughs> but um, check that out. Um, we can see what we post. Uh, we also post our uh, YouTube videos on our Facebook page. And Anthony, currently on camera right now, he's gonna go on Facebook. I, I guarantee you he's going to go on Facebook and say, I was on camera today, and no, I was not announcing. He's just like that. If, the, if you had to pay to post on Facebook, Anthony would be in debt by a tremendous amount. I, if I, he got paid, though, he'd be a millionaire. Here's what you do. Here's your challenge. If you're at home watching this right now or online, go find Anthony D'Agostino on Facebook and friend him, and I guarantee you, the next 10 notifications, Anthony will at least be seven of them on your timeline. <laughs> and if he is, I want you to tweet us at CUTV underscore PA 
and you will then be on a broadcast and have been notified then that you are true Facebook friends with Anthony Agostino. <laughs> Give or take seven, you know, there could be more. He could be all 10. That would be yeah. a, a new record as well. I, I remember at one point, my last 10 notifications were all from Anthony. He lives on Facebook. He nods his head in agreement, so he can't just deny it. Now a high drive out here for Brooks will get out. Garrett Brooks sends it a long drive, and that one's gone. Makes it a 12-2 ball game. Maybe a little too late for this contest, but good to see that the offense still producing some runs. It's never too late, you know. You just stay in this game, and Garrett Brooks showing some heart just rockets that ball even. You know, you saw Mercierst hit that off the fence. Uh, that was even farther enough that it went over. It cleared everything out there. So great hit, uh, great way to just turn on that ball and get a shot out there to left field. Now Waschak coming up, he's got some power too. First pitch outside for a ball. So 12 to two the score now. The Vulcans, every time the Lakers have not scored an inning, the Vulcans come back and score themselves. Look to collect a couple runs here as this one's grounded back to Nasinski. Throwing the first for the out. And Nasinski here doesn't let that batter, that last batter, Garrett Brooks, get to him and, and gets Waschak out pretty easily. It looked like if, if Waschak really stayed in there and waited on that pitch, he really could have got something going there. Look, maybe even got that pitch, or got that hit into the gap. Um, it was kind of shading over that way. Uh, but right back to the pitcher, unfortunately, in that case. We're going to see Christian Webb come up to the plate now. First pitch outside for ball one. Bottom of the sixth here, the penultimate inning, unless California is able to make a miraculous comeback. This one dives down, ball two. And that pitch broke in even as well. I could see that from here. That was one pitch that I saw uh, that kind of broke in and, and got that to fall. Webb shoots one down the line and it goes foul. That pitch actually hit off of the side of the fence over there in the Vulcans bullpen. So now time was, play was stopped as to get that ball out of play. And on deck for the Vulcans is Taylor Zachman, a junior from Bordentown, New Jersey. And he will come out to hit for Joe Yorgel as this one's grounded into the five hole for a base hit. Great hit there. Uh, it's something that the Lakers have been known to do today. And uh, Christian Webb getting one on base brings up a new hitter for the Vulcans. And Zachman, his first plate appearance today, coming in for Joe Yorgel, who is the starter for next next contest, and maybe get him prepared uh, for the next ball game that'll come up about 30 minutes after the conclusion of this one. And maybe, you know, Nasinski might be getting tired. Maybe the velocity's kind of tailed off on some of his pitches, leaving him a little bit easier to hit for the Vulcans. We'll see what Zachman can do here. This first pitch in there for a strike. Zachman just coming off the bench as a pinch hitter. Gonna have to see a couple pitches before he maybe gets into the swing of things. No pun intended. <laughs> nice hole in right center field though. And this one is grounded foul. Looked like it hit off the plate as well, so it'd be 0-2. But yes, the outfielders for Mercer's are shading him over to the opposite field. And the way the Nasinski's been throwing today, a lot of the Balls have gone that way, but it just takes one guy to connect with a gap on the right center field side. Uh, maybe get uh, Webb at least to third base. And the infield for the Lakers as well are in a uh, double play uh, kind of strategical way. Um, so they're definitely trying to see what they can do with a pinch hitter up. That's one thing. You don't see any shifts in the infield like you do in the major leagues here in the college game. And Zachman fouls it off and... Donato not able to hold on to it, so he stays alive 0-2. And, and I am not a proponent for shifting. I do not like it because uh, there's so many guys. John Jason with the Pirates is the one guy that I think breaks the shift better than anybody because they shift him to the right side. He keeps hitting it to the other side. Eventually, you're going to have to stop that. 
as this one in there for an outside strike and Zachman goes down looking. And unfortunately coming off the bench, it's it's hard to, to kind of get your heel out of the pitcher really quick and, and just a uh, strikeout looking and everybody else in this Vulcans roster at this point have seen Asinski at least once, maybe even twice today. So they're a little bit more, uh, they know how he pitches. Yeah, exactly. And Logan takes one outside for ball one. Logan reached on an error by the third baseman. His last time up, he's 0 for 2 today. This one in there for a strike about middle of his chest. Grove on deck. And Jared Grove, he's due. He's the guy that's been hitting him right at the outfielders on great contact every time. Maybe you get this guy on, maybe get Grove an opportunity. And this one is grounded. It's gonna roll just foul. Looked like it might have stayed fair for a second, but it just trickled away. And the Lakers look like they even picked that ball up when it was fair. Uh, but just a call that didn't go the Vulcans way there. It was very, very close. And it's just one of those that you let it go because, hey, if he gets a hit out of it, fine, whatever. It was just one of those luck of the rolls, but it did go foul. So now one and two, the count on Logan. Shortstop gets the pitch, and he swings and misses. That'll end the inning. Yeah, and the Vulcans there got one runner on, Christian Webb hit into the gap, and that's what they needed to do. And they also got a run out of that inning with a home run into left field. But we'll check out some replays here of today's game. As you see there, a, a great hit for this was the, like the Lakers. This was the first RBI hit of the game as Fennell played it quickly off the batter's eye. That held, uh, that was Gonzalez to a long RBI single. Uh, Mercer only scored one in that inning, and then here scored another one, made it two nothing after the second or top of the second inning. You mentioned Gonzalez. I'm looking at the box score from yesterday's game one, and Gonzalez actually homered to left field, got two RBIs in, in the third inning, and uh, something that the Vulcans really took into consideration and kind of limited his production today, um, as he has really done nothing. Um, got a, a pitcher. Uh, decision got thrown out uh, to first base. So just trying to use what they learned yesterday as this is the third time that they're facing Mercy Hurst this season, um, kind of see what they can do in game two as this is the top of the seventh inning. Warner will stay out there to pitch for the Vulcans and I think why not? He had a very good uh, top of the six, look like he could close this one out for the Vulcans as it's the top of the seven. They'll get one more time at bat, down by 10 runs. It will be Fantaski, Cox, and Elange up for the Lakers here. And you gotta think, if, if the Vulcans get out of this jam, uh, being down by, by 10, um, they got to see if maybe they can get some production out of their offense. Uh, as Jared Grove, like you said, he's due for a hit. Um, he has been hitting it to the outfield, so see if he can kind of start the production for the Vulcans um, in, the, in their last chance. And actually here, Drew Borowski for Mercer will be pinch hitting to lead off the inning. He watches the first one go outside for a ball. So Mercer is emptying their bench, getting some guys playing time. And it's always important to get them some playing time, especially as the playoffs approach, because if somebody happens to go down with an injury, heaven forbid, you want to have guys that you know you're confident with and have had game action to go out there and play. Especially on this strong Lakers team, even. And it's ball three in there for Warner, who not been able to find the zone yet with the first three pitches at the top of the seventh. 3-0. The is in there for a strike. And see if he can come back on Borowski. And two young uh, players out there on the mound and behind the plate for Coach Conti's team. And an outside strike is called Borowski. Started going to first base, had to quickly turn around and go back into the box. 3-2 count here now, and I can't tell you how many times I've seen guys get down 3-0 and then come back and strike out. And he won't strike out here, actually. Line one into right field for a base hit. And kind of looked like he hit the cover off the ball even. Um, that was a hard hit ball 
into the, the gap between second and first. And it was a great shot there from the, the Lakers to put a guy on first for them. And kind of wish we had the stat cast that MLB is using now to test, you know, exit velocity, distance covered on balls um, in the outfield, uh, how fast the pitcher's throwing, how fast the outfielders are throwing. That one at least probably in the hundreds um, as far as how fast that came off the bat. Or a couple days ago, Aaron Hicks of the Yankees, he uncorked one from the outfield to home plate at 105 miles an hour. You don't even see pitchers throwing that hard. Yeah, I think that that was the highest recorded uh, velocity that that, that StatCast has recorded. Yeah. Um, I don't know how long that has been around for. StatCast has been around maybe a couple years. Fennell backtracking on the ball. He gets it right before the warning track. And Cox, a long fly ball, but it's out number one. Just got to think Fennell kind of uh, – exhibits that kind of velocity when he throws the ball in, being that he has a very strong arm uh, from center field. And you gotta think he has that kind of uh, play style that Andrew McCutcheon for uh, for the Pirates does as well. And Fennell is a starting pitcher as well for this team. He has five wins today, or um, into today's action. This one is in there for a strike against Alonge. Chris Gonzalez up on deck, and you mentioned he's kind of been the big terror for the Lakers here the last couple games. Delonge swung on a miss on the off-speed pitch, 0-2. Delonge waiting for the 0-2 from Warner. Outside, ball one. And Christian Webb behind the plate there kind of popping up every once in a while, um, just getting that runner on first to just know that he's around. He will fire one down the first baseline and, and get a tag on you. And now ground ball foul wide of first base. And keep the count at one and two. Brandon Warner, he's had a couple of balls put in play, but for the most part, he's been limiting what the Lakers have done over the last couple innings. Maybe he'd get out of this one without letting the Lakers score yet again. One and two. Outside, evens count. Looked like even, or that was a, an off-speed pitch, or uh, maybe even just trying to keep the runner at first honest. Uh, kind of came up. It was even outside the zone, so it looked like he popped up yet again. This one fouled away again into the Mercier's dugout. A nice play there by the Mercier's coach, though. Wasn't able to hold on, but he looked like he almost grabbed it barehanded going into his uh, torso. Right next to I-70. Console Energy Park, the scene today as Warner throws on, and this one in there for a strike on the outside. The curveball dipped in at the last second to get Alonje looking. Yeah, and a great call there by the umpire. Seeing that pitch was in the zone and uh, just getting that one there. Huge for the Vulcans as they need to get out of this inning so they can get to work on the offensive side. Yeah, you still got an opportunity. You got three outs to play with. You down 10 runs. Hey, crazier things have happened before. Gonzalez, skies one deep. Over towards our camera people, better watch out. And it goes right behind camera uh, two. As Ryan gives us a thumbs up, he was okay, but he was in no immediate danger, so I don't know why he's giving us a thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> Owen one now after a long strike. Gonzalez today, a couple doubles, a single as well, and flown out uh, to the catcher. Definitely gotta be cognizant if you're a spectator not only that, but also, like you said, I-70 is right over there. A foul ball could could end up over there. I mean, that has to be a it pretty would take hard a, hit. It would take a lot of power to get that over there. Now, Gonzalez ground ball to the shortstop. Logan tosses on to second for the third out. And that will do it with the top of the seventh. And the Vulcans down 12-2 to two going to the bottom of the inning. And, you know, Danny, again, you and I here, I – Imagine this is your first baseball broadcast, my third now in four years doing this with CTV, and unfortunately, it is my last broadcast. And yeah, you know, calling so many contests between basketball and football, softball, baseball, soccer, 
hockey, um, countless other volleyball, countless other things that we've done over the last four years. It's been the best experience of my life. Um, and I'm never, ever going to forget some of the moments that I've had on crew and some of the action I've seen here in the games that we've covered. Uh, I know I've only known you for about a year now, but I can call you a very good friend and hopefully been able to teach you enough about what's going on here at CTV and enough that you can have uh, su some success. And I hope I've done that with all of the people on crew that I've gotten to know over the last few years. And I just want to say thank you to everybody on the crew that's not only my friends, they're my family now. I'm going to talk to them for the rest of my life. And, of course, JR, who uh, kind of oversees everything, and, of course, Gary. I have to thank you for uh, being the best director, producer, and teacher I've ever had in life. And apparently I'm getting some of Gary Skittles now. <laughs> I, I request <laughs> the ultimate <laughs> sign of love and respect. I, I want you to put them in alphabetical order for me first, though. <laughs> <laughs> now, Grove swings on the first pitch, couldn't hold up his check swing. It's Elwin won the count now. And being that I'm extremely young in, in CUTV uh, and respect that I'm only a freshman, uh, I just want to say thank you for teaching me everything in, in this short year and learning, like you said, uh, whether it be basketball, football, starting in high school football, I actually did my first broadcast with Anthony. And, but just learning what you say to fill the gaps, that's obviously the huge part, uh, being that this is my first uh, baseball game, first baseball broadcast. It's it's definitely hard to to learn a team and kind of fill those gaps with information. And you've done a, a great job of teaching not only me but everybody else here how to do it. And and also Steve, I can talk for Steve as well, yeah. Because um, I'm sure that he he feels the exact same way. Well, thank you, sir. And one and two, the count now on Grove. Here's the pitch, and it's down low to even the count. Nasinski still out there. Looks like Mercer's committed to giving him the complete game victory if he's able to hold the Vulcans off the scoreboard. Only gave up two runs today, only five hits as well. Grove watches it outside to bring the count full at three and two. Now Grove drives one in the outfield and yet again line drive right to the corner outfielder. And Grove I think has put the ball in the bat better than anybody in the team today just right at the corner outfielders. Yeah, and this is something that Coach Conti told us pregame. He said that, you know, my guys can't really be at fault for these for these hits. Um, they're doing what they're supposed to. Uh, it's just where it's not at the right spot. It's at the wrong spot at the wrong time. And uh, it's very unfortunate for the Vulcans because this is a talented team. They definitely are, have a lot of talent on this team, whether it be with these young guys or the older guys in Mick Fennell and, uh, and also David Marcus not being in. This is a talented team. They have something going for them. And just getting the ball, just it can't get it placed the right spot. 2-0 on the count now after another pitch from Nasinski. One out, bottom of the seventh. Bobby Thompson up to hit. Kraus on deck. And then Fennell in the hole. Now Thompson swings and misses, bring the count two and one. And after he swung there, he was like, "Ah, oh, that was that was a good pitch. I swung a little bit late, and he did. Um, but you know, see if he can connect with this next next pitch." Now Thompson grounds it up the line, but it'll go foul. Two and two now the count. You know, hustle, uh, that play was uh, a, a showing hustle there late in this game. Um, he knows it was foul, but just hustling down the base pass shows his coach that, you know, he's going to stay into this game. Uh, he's not really going to get discouraged at all, and that's something that you look, for, uh, you look for in a player. And a new catcher in there, Dominic Paolucci, as now Thompson swings on and misses in the inside pitch. He goes down swinging for the first time today, but Dominic Paolucci, he, he had to come out of that spot to get that... Uh, ground ball as well, so maybe a chance to get on, but goes down swinging, and Levi Krause, the last opportunity for California to maybe make a late run here. Krause watches in there for a strike. And Krause has done it earlier in this contest, like I said before, at the in the bottom of the third inning, um, getting some, some uh, much needed base runners on. This one dives down. They'll even count at one. I'd like to see Fennell get another opportunity to hit. I like watching him hit. He's a very good hitter, very patient, 
a leadoff guy. And now Kraus skies one out of play to the right side. Back towards the interstate, but not enough to get it there. And you mentioned, you know, balls to the interstate where my high school field was. We had a giant wall and then there was the road. And I have one of my uh, former teammates who plays for the Boston Red Sox single A affiliate now, Michael Chavis. He hit plenty of home runs over on that street. And actually he did hit one into the bed of a truck once. No lie is that will do it for the game here today. 12 to two the final as Kraus pops up to the shortstop. Nasinski gets the complete game victory only giving up five hits. Two runs both earned. He had one walk in the ball game and he struck out five as well. A big victory there for Mercyhurst who pads their division lead to three over the Vulcans now. And the California Vulcans though, an opportunity to bring it down to two, be able to win the second game. And Danny, final thoughts of this one? Um, it was just a great performance by Nasinski. Uh, that's all you can really say. Uh, you know, that limited the Vulcans production to a very low level of only two scores up there. Um, but we can see here, that's what they can do in game two. And hopefully the California bats come alive. Pitching maybe keeps Mercyhurst off the board. We'll see what happens in game two. Make sure you tune in to CUTV for that one. For Danny Beck, the entire CUT crew, I'm Zach Prosva. Thanks for watching, and continue watching CUTV.